There will now be an opportunity for silent meditation, <laughs> silent prayer or meditation. Thank you very much, honorable members. You may be seated. Order. My English is going to be a meditation between. Because I am certain there's not a single member here who does not live on medication. All the honorable members. Honorable members, the secretary will read the order of the day. Debate on vote number one, the presidency, appropriation bill. I now call upon the honorable the president to open the debate. Speaker of the National Assembly, Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa, Muhulisei Paul Mashatile, Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members and Fellow South Africans. Uri ndiime panda ha parlamente, ndive mafungo a budget ya office ya president. Unenda shumisana hone na bo Paul Mashatile. This presidency budget vote is being presented on the understanding that all of us gathered here in this house all share a responsibility to build a new nation and to serve the people of South Africa and to improve the lives of every South African, leaving no one behind. Above all, we all have a shared responsibility to uphold the Constitution, which affirms the inherent worth, fundamental human rights, and dignity of every South African. This shared responsibility reaches beyond the precincts of Parliament and the offices of state, as we are all called upon to exercise this very important responsibility to build our country, to uphold our constitution fully, cognizant that it extends across all parts of our society, from business, trade unions, from traditional leaders, to religious bodies, our various community-based organizations, and to the citizens themselves. As we face some of the most difficult and severe challenges since the dawn of our democracy, we are all called upon to be part of the solution to make a difference. But by Sukaufela, 
ba shebile rona ba mona ntlung yena gore re sebetse mmo gore mathata a re shebaneng le yona re le badula po ba South Africa re khone go ararol as i introduce the debate on vote 1 the presidency budget vote I'm keenly aware of the duty this office carries. Office lei ya kusungula la tikweni raina iona efanlo kuri iba office lei ngataba na burangeli kuri ikota kulanguta amashwe. At varying points in the history of this democracy. We have met with both triumph and despair. Even though at times our problems have seemed too large, too difficult to overcome, we have, however, emerged from these challenges stronger and more united. This time of crisis, difficulties and challenges will be no different. Sipete ubunzima, obukulu kakulu, kule esklesha esigulo, koto wage asikale ugubalapa la asikona. Sesige sae lula lendela, sae hamba futi. South Africans have great expectations of all of us to make great efforts to resolve the many difficulties that they as citizens of this country face. In the State of the Nation address, we outlined the work that government would undertake in the course of this year to both respond to the challenges of the present and to advance the clear mandate it has built on with regard to an inclusive economy that creates employment and alleviates poverty. This budget vote gives us an opportunity to outline the progress that has been made thus far, but also gives us an opportunity to outline some of the tasks that lie ahead. Given the extent and the depth of the challenges we face, the benefits of the work that is being done will not be felt immediately. But it clearly lays the foundation of the success that lies ahead. What I can say, though, is that progress is being made on a number of fronts. We are getting there, and we will get there. Our journey to where we want to go may seem long, but if we stay the course, difficult as our path is, we will get through our challenges if we keep working together. As we undertake the commitments outlined in the State of the Nation Address, we are focused on those actions that will make the greatest impact. These are the actions that will make a difference in the short term and that will also lay the basis for sustainable progress into the future. Over the last few weeks, the Deputy President and I have met with each of our ministers to identify specific tasks that they and their departments must focus on over the next year. The tasks that each of my cabinet colleagues will focus on, taken together, will respond to those issues that concern South Africans the most. These concerns include the impact of load shedding on households, businesses, hospitals, water provision, food production, and all aspects 
of our people's lives. These concerns include unemployment, poverty and the rising cost of living. The situation is worsened by inflation and the effects of rising interest rates on household debt and how it debilitates business from borrowing cheaply. South Africans are also concerned about gender-based violence, crime, and corruption. If we are to effectively address these concerns, we need first and foremost to grow the economy and to create jobs. A vital part of this work is to mobilize the resources as well as capabilities of all social partners. Over the last few months, we have been having deep and meaningful engagements with representatives of business, labor, and other constituencies where we've been dealing with the collective actions that need to be taken by all to address the various challenges that constrain our economic growth. This will enable us to focus on key issues which pose an immediate threat to our economy. We have established three work streams between government and business, focusing on energy, logistics, and crime and corruption. This will enable joint action alongside other social partners on these critical challenges. Our overriding priority now is to end load shedding and to achieve energy security. In July last year, I announced a detailed plan to address the energy crisis. I have since established the National Energy Crisis Committee to ensure that this plan is fully implemented and appointed a dedicated minister in the presidency to provide a single point of execution. Doru Keta, Minister Hononi, Anofi Ramukhopa, Dawanoreba Tubanji by Elishango, Bazitanganese. Nahobo was as we face a sis of Woody, Zafalo Resito Aruches was a Woody, Paine Novege of Irao, Isisha Mulekashi, Isibe Cacabano, Basitwisisa, Quendelaini, Cor Acota, and Antiruayena, and Combella Curi, Mufumela, Cor Auenda, and Tiroloy. I found that the 191 Ayakati power stations led. Ayakubo Nakuri, Titiranja Nina Nakuri, Tifamiswanja Nina. Over the past nine months, we have made progress in implementing the measures that we did outline in the energy plan. First, in line with our economic reforms in network industries, we have allowed the private sector to invest in electricity generation projects of any size. This was a new development, and hitherto then, it had never even been contemplated. Following that, more than 100 projects are now at various stages of development representing over 10,000 megawatts of new generation capacity and with an investment of over 200 billion rand. The exponential growth of private sector investment in electricity generation is proof that this reform is indeed having a major impact. These investments will significantly close the shortfall in electricity supply as we move on. What has been pleasing in this regard is that this reform process has attracted 
a variety of investors in the form of women-led businesses Dar and the Nordlex Sekap, Atek, Biafro Mensa and Mut, but and here this word is. They are generating energy as women. I have also met a number of black investors here in the Western Cape in Pumalanga as well as in KZN who are deeply steeped in energy generation. The local traditional investors have also thrown their weight behind this opportunity we have opened. And so have foreign investors as well. From as far afield as China, from as far afield as the Middle East, the United States, Canada, India, Turkey, and Europe. A province such as the Northern Cape has now attracted no less than Ian Honor billion fund Rande fund investments. Milliard, milliard, milliard. In renewable energy and is seeing exponential economic growth in the province with the resultant, resultant rather, creation of jobs. Second, we have accelerated the procurement of new generation capacity. Three projects from the risk mitigation program have entered construction, with a further five projects expected to reach financial close during this quarter. Project agreements have been signed for 25 preferred bidders from bid window five and bid window six, accounting to approximately 2,800 megawatts, of which 784 rather is already in construction. In the coming months, we will initiate the procurement of more than 10,000 megawatts of additional generation capacity from wind, solar, gas, and battery storage, which will further contribute to closing the shortfall in energy supply. Third, Madam Speaker, we have enabled municipalities to themselves procure power independently. Since we implemented this reform, a number of municipalities have embarked on the process to procure additional powers of as much as 1,500 megawatts. <clears throat> Fourth, we are driving progress on the unbundling of ESCOM into separate entities for generation, transmission, and distribution, a process that a number of countries have also embarked upon to good effect in the past, and a number are also doing so as we speak. Significant progress has been made towards the establishment of the National Transmission Company of South Africa as an independent subsidiary of ESCOM. I've asked the Minister of Public Enterprises to ensure that an independent board is appointed for the new transmission company by the end of June, so that it can be fully operational as soon as possible. I'm sorry, Honorable Members Kumbuzo. Honorable Members, will you please mute your mics? Honorable members on the virtual platform, will you please mute your mics? Thank you. You may proceed, Honorable President. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At the same time, we are making progress in decisively addressing ESCOM's dead burden. The 2029 budget introduced 254 billion in debt relief to ESCOM, subject to conditions. This will relieve pressure on the utilities balance sheet, enabling it to conduct necessary maintenance and supporting the restructuring of the electricity market. Finally, we are pursuing sweeping legislative reform to end the energy crisis once and for all with the help of this House.
We have already introduced the Electricity Regulation Amendment Bill, which seeks to establish a competitive electricity market and support the unbundling of ESCO. This will fundamentally transform the electricity sector as we know it and as we have known it in the past and will create a level playing field for multiple generators to participate in producing the energy that we need. A country like China has perfected this, where a number of generators compete with each other, and that has also brought prices of energy down. We will soon introduce another key piece of legislation, the Energy Security Bill, to streamline the regulatory framework and accelerate the construction of any renewable energy projects. I call on members of this House from all political parties to pass this critical legislation in record time while adhering, of course, to parliamentary processes. We need to do so in months and not in years. At the moment of grave crisis, as I have said, we must pull together and place the interests of our people above all else. Despite this progress, however, the performance of ESCOM's existing generation fleet continues to deteriorate as a result of its age and a legacy of poor maintenance and under investment, and yes, corruption as well. We face a difficult winter ahead as demand increases and several units at Midupi, Kusile, and Quebec power stations are currently under repair and remain offline. These six units alone, Minister Ramukhopa tells me, represent approximately 4,500 megawatts of capacity, or between four and five stages of load shedding. The situation will improve as we return these units to service towards the end of this year. Until then, our best hope of limiting the severity of load shedding is to reduce demand on the grid. As announced in the State of the Nation Address, tax incentives have been introduced to support the rollout of rooftop solar for households. Just as we came together to stop the spread of COVID-19, we must all act now to bring down demand and over the winter months. We can all make a difference by switching off lights, and appliances were not in use, reducing the temperatures of our geysers to 60 degrees, installing a geyser blanket or geyser timer to save energy and reduce your electricity bill, and to turn off unnecessary equipment like pool pumps and so on. By taking these simple actions and measures, we can reduce demand by up to 1,000 megawatts or one full stage of load shedding. We must reiterate that the risk of a national blackout remains extremely low. There are many safeguards in place to prevent such an eventuality from occurring. Load shedding allows ESCOM to keep the system in balance at all times. The work that we are doing, Madam Speaker, to urgently resolve the current electricity shortfall does not diminish our commitment to a just energy transition. We will stick to our commitment to reduce our carbon emissions by 2030 to within a target range which at its upper level is compatible with limiting global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We need to do this to prevent the worst effects of climate change, 
including illness, droughts, floods, and other disasters. We also need to protect jobs in sectors of our economy that have to decarbonize to remain globally competitive. Where it may be necessary to delay the decommissioning of coal-fired power stations temporarily to address our electricity supply shortfall, any decision will be informed by a detailed technical assessment of the feasibility of continuing to operate older power stations and the cost of doing so relative to alternative energy sources. It will also be informed by the time frame in which we can expect new generation capacity and the impact of our decarbonization trajectory. At the same time, we will further accelerate the pace of investment in new in renewable electricity generation at an important part of the plan, as an important part of the plan to overcome load shedding. Viewed in totality, the Energy Action Plan must be seen as a springboard to a just energy transition, boosting the rollout of renewable energy sources, mobilizing significant investment, and creating new jobs in new sectors, from electric vehicles to solar installation to the hydrogen economy and many other subsectors. As we work to end the energy crisis, we are moving ahead with the economic reform agenda to revive economic growth and create jobs. Operation Vulindela, the cooperation between Treasury and the Presidency, is working closely with the Department of Public Enterprises, the Department of Transport, and Transnet to finalize a roadmap for the freight logistics sector. This roadmap will shortly be completed and will outline the actions to improve the performance of our ports, which used to be high performance ports in the past. It will also improve the performance of our rail, as well as measures to reform Transnet and create an efficient and competitive freight logistics system. To address the challenges in freight rail and port operations, we are forging cooperation at a very practical level with business, with unions, in the sectors such as logistics, agriculture, the auto industry, mining, and forestry. Now, Transnet is working to establish a separate infrastructure manager within Transnet Freight Rail, which will enable third-party access to the core rail network. In addition, partnerships with private terminal operator, operators at the Durban and Moha Terminal will help to improve the performance of our ports and also lead to the crowding in of the private sector to invest. At the fifth South African Investment Conference last month, I announced that we will be implementing far-reaching reforms to our visa system to attract skills, much needed skills that we may not have, but more importantly, investments. Two weeks ago, the Minister of Home Affairs published a detailed implementation plan to take forward the recommendations of the work visa review. This plan outlines fundamental changes to our visa system. These include introducing a trusted employer scheme to provide a simplified process for qualifying companies and streamlining application requirements. We are establishing also a points-based system 
that will provide additional pathways for visa applicants based on their income and qualifications to introduce greater predictability, flexibility, as well as transparency into the visa system. We are also creating new visa categories for remote workers as well as startups in business. Government has also rolled out the e-visa system to an additional 20 countries for tourist visas. In this financial year, we plan to introduce the e-visa system to other areas such as business, study, general work, intra-company transfer visas. Attracting more tourists, growing the tourism economy, and creating more jobs in the sector is vital to our economic recovery efforts. The most recent data from Stats SA and South African Tourism show the sector is firmly on the road to recovery. Last year, nearly 5.7 million visitors came to our country, and in the first quarter of 2023, we received over 2 million visitors, more than double the amount in the same period last year. As we work to shorten the time it takes to issue tourist visas, we are also unblocking funding for transformation in the sector. We are addressing the delays in issuing tour operator licenses and training tourism monitors to improve tourist safety in various parts of the country. We are making progress on a number of other priority reforms, Madam Speaker, including putting in place a modern and fully transparent mining rights system, creating an enabling regulatory framework for hemp and cannabis, and clearing the backlog of title deeds for subsidized housing. Over time, these reforms will propel economic growth and enable companies to create sustainable new jobs. Five years have now passed since we embarked on an ambitious investment drive to raise 1.2 trillion rand in new investment in our economy. As the fifth South African Investment Conference due to a drew to a close on the 13th of April, we were able to announce that we had surpassed that target, having raised over 1.5 trillion rand in investment commitments. These commitments are steadily and surely translating into investments into the productive economy, establishing new enterprises, expanding existing ones, providing opportunities to suppliers along the value chain and creating employment, and in many cases, helping for the creation of black emerging companies. These are significant achievements in the midst of great economic headwinds, not least of which was the disruption caused by COVID-19 and by the effects of the electricity crisis that we are going through right now. The mobilization of investment from both local and international companies has been accompanied by focused support on small business and cooperatives. For example, in the last financial year, nearly 75,000 small, medium enterprises and cooperatives received financial support through the Small Enterprise Finance Agency. These funding interventions created well over 32,000 jobs and sustained over 70,000 existing jobs. Changes have been made to the Bounce Back Loan Guarantee Scheme, which was introduced in 2022 to incentivize the rooftop solar investments to reduce the effects of load shedding and small medium enterprises. The Minister of Trade and Industry and Competition recently announced the establishment of an energy resilient fund of 1.3 billion rand to help enterprises, including small medium enterprises to mitigate 
the impact of load shedding. The recovery of our economy relies on a massive increase in investment. As we have reported before, we have been working to improve the capacity of government departments, various agencies, state-owned enterprises, and partners to prepare and implement infrastructure projects. This, week, this work is starting to see results. In its most recent work, the budget facility for infrastructure approved blended finance projects with a project value of 57 billion rand. And these are mainly for bulk water, port development, and housing projects. On the basis of a fiscal commitment of 21 billion rand, the infrastructure fund will engage with financial markets to enable investment in these projects by private sectors to ensure that these investments are indeed realized. Now, by gazetting a number of infrastructure projects, we are able to ensure that multiple authorizations, permit giving, and approvals are speeded up. And as a result, Madam Speaker, the total value of projects completed last year is some 21 billion rand. These include housing settlement projects, like the Fochville Extension to Sondela and GP's Town Social Housing in Gauteng. Other completed projects include upgrades to the national roads, as well as a number of other small harbors. The value of projects currently in construction is over 300 billion rand, including energy, water, infrastructure, and rural roads projects. The development of a pipeline of green hydrogen projects with a value of over 300 billion rand is quite significant. Among these projects is the Bukhobai Green Hydrogen in the Northern Cape with the potential to create thousands of jobs. This will lay the basis for the development of a wholly new industry that will draw on South Africa's natural resources. And as you well know, we have the presidential employment stimulus, which remains a vital intervention by government to create work and livelihood opportunities, particularly at a time when the broader economy is not creating employment at the necessary pace. This builds on the achievements of over for many years of public employment programs, EPWP, and community work programs. The stimulus created well over 600,000 job opportunities, and these opportunities created were in areas as diverse as basic education, small-scale farming, arts, and culture. This brings the total number of participants in this whole project to 1.2 million people. Implementing government's program of action rests on having a capable developmental state. To this end, our focus is on strengthening the capacity of the civil service to deliver on the mandate of serving the people of South Africa. We applaud the many public servants in our country who continue to serve the people of South Africa with diligence and commitment. And they do indeed deserve a round of applause from all of us. <laughs> to root out malfeasance in the public service, we do plan to complete various processes such as skills audit, lifestyle audits, particularly at the senior management level. As part of our response to recommendations of state capture, 
We have prioritized the establishment of a single register for disciplinary cases and processes across spheres of government. Cabinet recently approved for public comment a bill that would expand the powers of the Public Service Commission, including giving commission authority over local government. This will go a long way to improving the professionalization and accountability of all spheres of our administration. From the advent of democracy, we have recognized that the challenge of poverty and hunger requires a broad range of interventions and programs that work together to address the various causes and manifestations of poverty. This informs the programs we have pursued in human settlements, in land reform, expansion of free basic services, provision of social grants, and improving access to education and health care. In addition to these programs, one of the most important recent interventions has been the special SRD grant, which provided support to unemployed South Africans to counter the effects of COVID-19. Building on that experience and looking beyond that grant, several government departments led by the presidency are working to ensure that poor households do have access to a comprehensive set of interventions that create pathways out of poverty. This plan would harness the resources and capabilities of all government departments in an integrated and coordinated manner to enable productive livelihoods, maximize the impact of social security and well, as well as social services, ensure household food security, and enable sustainable human settlements and land reform. As announced in the State of the Nation Address, Rishabani Lehuri Grant Ena Eba to Kabunga Jabai Bitsang 350. Hore Ikai Swapili Juan Lehona Hore Rikai Baka Nyakati Lai Fing Rishabiliati Latsuli Hore Ikono who two Sabbath to buy a su Harin Territual Lapi. During the course of this financial year, the Minister of Social Development will lead the development of an integrated database to enhance delivery of social protection and enable poverty alleviation programs to be integrated. The achievement of affordable universal health care is vital for improving human health, reducing inequality, and enabling South Africans to live more productive lives. A major milestone towards this goal has been achieved with the adoption of the National Health Insurance Bill by the Portfolio Committee on Health, which will soon be debated in this National Assembly. We commend the members and staff of the Portfolio Committee who have worked so hard to process the legislation and all those organizations individual, and individuals who made submissions mm -hmm. and all those people who participated in public hearings. There are still a number of sectors in our country who still want to put their views forward and I'm sure that as the National Assembly engages with this bill, they will open their ears to some of those. As the NHI bill is finalized through the legislative process, and as it is implemented, we are determined to ensure that it both fulfills the goal of universal access to quality health care and builds on the significant capabilities of the public and private healthcare sectors. 
progress is being made in preparation for the implementation of the NHI, including interventions to improve the quality of public and private health care and the rollout of the electronic patient registration system across public health facilities. Madam Speaker, the implementation of the NHI will be a momentous step forward, achieving universal health coverage and creating a society built on justice, fairness, and social solidarity, as it was envisaged in the Freedom Charter. Let us embrace this opportunity to create a healthier, more equitable future for all South Africans. We are indeed determined that the implementation of the NHI effectively tackles inequality in healthcare in a sustainable manner. It is a matter of concern that according to the latest progress in international reading literacy study, as many as 81% of grade four pupils cannot read for meaning in our country. Unless we grasp this challenge with the necessary urgency and application, this reality will undermine the prospects of South African children and stand our nation's development. The Minister of Basic Education will therefore prioritize interventions to ensure that all 10-year-old learners can read for meaning. By Order. the end of this financial Order. year. Order. Madam Speaker, but by the end of the, this financial year, an integrated sector reading plan must be developed and implemented across all provinces. This includes the provision of a package of lessons, lesson plans and reading materials. And I will be spending more time in enhancing the President's Reading Circle program. That I will invite a number of members of this House to join, because it look, does look like some of them need to join that. <laughs> As I encourage all learners to be part of the Reading Drive. We are on course to eradicate unsafe toilets in public schools. Yes, yes, we are on course. Five years ago, around 3,400 schools did not have adequate sanitation facilities. Today, there are 750 schools that still need to be provided with safe and appropriate sanitation. These schools are scheduled for completion in this financial year. As part of the successful presidential employment stimulus, around a quarter of a million young people will be appointed and placed as school assistants by June 2023. Ministers, ministers across departments have been tasked to priorities and are meant to massify the training of young people in skills that are required by both to both implement government's programs and to make use of new opportunities in opening up our economy. For example, the Department of Transport will provide young people with skills-based training as train drivers, technicians, transport engineers, amongst others. The Department of Communications and Digital Technologies will establish partnerships to train young people in cell phone repairs, digital installation, and maintenance and aftercare. Ministers have been 
tasked to provide training to young people to enable them to make use of the surge in rooftop solar installation. The right to access to decent quality basic services is enshrined in our constitution. When citizens are exposed to conditions that imperil their right to safe drinking water, it is the worst affront to human dignity. Two weeks ago, there was an outbreak of cholera in Hammanskraal and in the Free State. Our thoughts and prayers are with those families who lost their loved ones, and we wish those who remain hospitalized a speedy recovery. Whilst an investigation is still underway into the source of the outbreak, we do know that cholera thrives in conditions where there is inadequate access to clean water and sanitation facilities. The people of Hammanskral have had to put up with water supply challenges for quite a long time, and unfortunately, their plight is not an isolated one. Two years ago, the, this administration reinstated the blue drop and green drop water quality monitoring systems to monitor the country's water quality. This will enable stronger intervention in municipalities that fail to meet the minimum norms. Last year's green drop reports points to serious challenges in our municipalities when it comes to managing water resources. That municipalities are underspending or not even utilizing critical grants to upgrade and maintain social infrastructure like water treatment facilities must be seen as being totally unacceptable. The Department of Water and Sanitation will continue its ongoing engagements with municipal managers, technical staff, mayors and councillors in districts to address this issue and provide support where it is necessary. The challenge in water provision highlights the broader challenge of dysfunctional municipalities in many areas. We need to strengthen local government by separating the administration from undue political influence. For example, the appointment process of officials such as municipal managers, as well as chief financial officers in municipalities, could and should involve competency verification by national departments like the Cooperative Governance and National Treasury as well. This would help to ensure people with the right skills and experience are appointed. Insecurity and acts of criminality and lawlessness deter investment, as we all know. Our focus is on improving the capacity of the police to prevent and investigate crime. In the State of the Nation address, we announced that we would embark on a massive recruitment and training process. In December last year, these new recruits graduated from various police academies. 10,000 trainees will be recruited annually for the next two financial years, bringing the total number in the current three-year period to 30,000. Of these, close to 3,000 will be allocated to the SAPS Detective Services. With support from the private sector, we are overhauling the 1011 call centers to ensure that people are able to access help when they need it. Additional financial resources have been allocated to supply and support community policing for us with much needed equipment. There are a number of SAPS operations that are underway to deal with the proliferation of illegal firearms, to tackle illegal mining, and to clamp down on theft and vandalism of economic infrastructure. Much of these intelligence-driven operations are being coordinated through the Directorate of Priority Crime Investigation. 
We will not allow criminal syndicates to operate in this country, and we are targeting those at the top to disrupt their networks. The newly established border management agency is in the process of recruiting additional border guards and work is underway to establish one-stop border posts at the country's six busiest ports of entry. Reform of our intelligence services is gaining momentum with the recent approval by cabinet of the General Intelligence Laws Amendment Bill. This is a major step in implementing the recommendations of the high-level panel on state security agency, the expert panel, and also the State Capture Commission. The bill provides framework for restructuring of our intelligence services. Despite progress in the implementation of the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence, we remain a long way from achieving a society where this scourge is eradicated. South Africans refuse to remain silent in the face of violent crime against women and children. One of the pillars that we have in the plan is legislative reform. Another advance is the substantial reduction of DNA backlog in support of DNA-driven investigations, the forensic science laboratories in Kabecha and KwaZulu-Natal will be revamped and refurbished. And I'm told that the DNA backlog has finally also been eliminated, as the Minister of Police said. <laughs> to strengthen the response of criminal justice Additional resources have been allocated to SEPs, Family Violence, Child Protection, and Sexual Offenses Units. To advance the economic empowerment of women, over 6,000 women entrepreneurs have been trained to participate in the public and pro procurement space. Over the last financial year, the IDC has provided massive loans. We are pursuing our struggle against gender-based violence at a continental level as well. In October last year, I submitted to Parliament a detailed plan for the implementation of state capture. As you all recall, the NPA's investigation directorate is taking the lead by processing cases that have been recommended, and they are being financially capacitated as well. To date, the ID is involved in investigating 10 major categories of complex corruption in government and state-owned enterprises. An integrated task force comprising the NPA and Hawks is prioritizing state capture cases and will continue to coordinate the response of law enforcement agencies. And the asset forfeiture unit is also working around the clock, as is the Special Investigation Unit. A mechanism has been established with the Department of Planning and Evaluation to monitor and track the implementation of various SIU recommendations, because the recurrent complaint is that many of the recommendations are not being implemented we see this as a critical tool that must be strengthened if we are to ensure that the SIU referrals are not disregarded. This is an issue I've raised sharply with the ministers in my engagement with them dealing with their performance targets. The National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council that was set up to advise government on society-wide fight against corruption has been very active. The council has organized itself into work streams that include legislative reforms and transparency, monitoring and evaluation. And they have already come up with a number of 
really positive, forward-looking proposals, including on how we should give more and further protection to whistleblowers. The Department of Justice and Constitutional Development is finalizing a review of the anti-corruption architecture for consultation. The department has committed to ensuring that reviews of the Protected Disclosures Act and witness protection are completed as well. Another milestone in the fight against corruption will be the tabling in Parliament of the Public Procurement Bill that is aimed at putting stronger safeguards in place to prevent corruption in public procurement. We have often said that our progress as a nation cannot be separated from the progress of our continent as a whole. We will continue to work with our counterparts elsewhere on the continent to ensure that the African Union has the necessary capacity to advance unity, development, and peace on the continent, to drive the growth, diversification, and development of African economies. We are working to ensure that the African continental free trade area is effectively implemented. Yet one of the greatest obstacles to the achievement of the AFCTA is the ongoing conflict and instability in several parts of the continent. We are deeply concerned about the fighting that continues in the Sudan and the resultant loss of life. We support all efforts to urgently resolve this conflict before more lives are lost and more damage is done. We remain committed to ensure the implementation of the peace agreement in Ethiopia that was arrived at here in South Africa and where our Minister of International Relations and Cooperation also played a key role. And we will contribute to regional and continental efforts towards peace and stability as we are in northern Mozambique, Eswatini, Eastern DRC, in South Sudan, and the completion of the various peace efforts and reform efforts in Lesotho. We are seeking to use our missions abroad more effectively to drive trade and investment. The Department of International Relations is working with other departments to ensure that our missions will seek out foreign in direct investment opportunities, promote tourism, and identify markets for us. Later this year, South Africa will be hosting the BRICS Summit. This is an important platform through which to advance our developmental objectives as a country and indeed as a continent. We have forged strong political, social, and economic ties with fellow BRICS countries, which this summit will consolidate and build on. And as many of you will know, BRICS has acquired a very important stature in the world with many countries across various continents of our world seeking to be part of it. We share common perspectives on the importance of multilateralism, a rules-based world order, and inclusive development. As part of our strategic intent to further advance the African development agenda within BRICS group, we are inviting several other African leaders to the summit. One of the priorities during our chairship of BRICS is to build a partnership between BRICS and Africa to unlock mutually beneficial opportunities for increased trade, investment, and infrastructure development. And South Africa continues to benefit from its participation in BRICS beyond trade and investment ties. For example, the New Development Bank which was established by BRICS countries in 2015, has to date approved 11 projects in South Africa valued at around 100 billion rand. 
in various road in various sectors, road improvement, ports, water, and energy. Our foreign policy stance, Madam Speaker, is informed by the understanding that multilateralism and respect for international law are key to global political and economic stability. We continue to work for the deepening and strengthening of progressive multilateralism and reform of multilateral institutions. That the UN Security Council excludes Africa in its participation is something that is totally unacceptable to us. There have been concerted efforts to draw South Africa into the broader geopolitical context around Russia and Ukraine conflict. Yet, yet we have consistently maintained our non-allied stance, our res respect for the UN Charter and the peaceful resolution through dialogue. Our understanding of non-alignment, which is distinct from the concept of neutrality, is rooted in the Bandung principles, which continue to guide the non-aligned movement. From the beginning of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, our position has been that this conflict needs to be resolved order, honorable members, through negotiation. Order. order. Please do not drown the speaker, please. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. South Africa, in pursuance of this stance which we articulated right from the beginning. When this conflict commenced, we did say, and we say it unambiguously even now, that conflicts of this nature need to be resolved in the way that we were taught by the father of our nation, Nelson Mandela. South Africa is pleased to participate in a mission by six African countries to seek a peaceful resolution to the conflict. We will soon be traveling to Kyiv in Ukraine, as well as traveling to Moscow in Russia to engage with the heads of states of these two countries to sue for peace and make sure <laughs> South Africa seeks to maintain good relations with all countries across the globe. As we work to strengthen ties of trade and investment, we also seek to build support for a more inclusive, representative, and equitable world order. We will continue to maintain an independent foreign policy and will use our presence in international forums to promote dialogue and peaceful resolution of conflicts. Where concerns are raised about our commitment to our position, we have addressed them, and we have addressed them directly and openly. In this regard, I will be sending, once again, the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, the Minister of Trade and Competition, the Minister of Finance, and the Minister in the Presidency as my envoys to the G7 countries, to explain our peace mission and to deal with various diplomatic matters. 
our engagements thus far with a number of G7 countries, including our African sister countries, on these matters have already drawn a lot of understanding and support. With a view to dealing with various matters that have to do with our international relations, I have recently appointed an independent panel headed by Justice Mujapelu to inquire into the circumstances of the docking of a Russian vessel in Simmons Town last year. The panel is expected to complete its work within six weeks and to submit its report to me within two weeks of concluding its work. Madam Speaker, there is no denying the severe challenges that our country faces, nor the determination of all South Africans to overcome the difficulties of the moment. The road ahead will indeed be demanding. It is therefore vital that we work together that we harness our collective resources, we harness our collective energy and wisdom to overcome the difficulties of the moment. We have achieved outstanding feats of human development since the advent of democracy, but there is much more that needs to be done. Let us continue working together to overcome these challenges of the present and build the better future that we seek and that all, so that all our people can lead a better life. Nihelela kwala, difeza enefa, diaribu. I thank you. I thank you, Honorable the President. Order, I now invite the Honorable the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Ha kilebuwe, memudula situlo, ki dumedise humu presidenta, Deputy President, all honorable members of this August House, Bazwadi.